welcome to Eastside Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here this morning. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate 52 years of all that God has done in and through the ministry of Eastside Baptist Church. We want to let you know about some things that we have coming up today and in the coming days here at Eastside Baptist Church. Today kicks off our Who's Your One campaign. We want to encourage you to invite someone to attend church with you this spring. Write their name on a 3 by 5 card and place that card in the box at the exit table and we'll place it on the cross. Continue to pray for that person and encourage them to come to church with you this spring. Next Sunday, March the 10th, is Daylight Savings Time. Don't forget to spring forward by one hour so you won't be late to church. Next Sunday, we'll have our outreach visitation, door-to-door -door outreach. After the service, the service next Sunday evening will be at 5 p.m. and we'll go out immediately following the service. Senior Saints on Tuesday, March the 12th at 11 a.m. will have our celebration. Come and join us. Food's provided. Sign up at one of the sign-up locations. Once again, thank you for joining us at Eastside Baptist Church this morning. We hope that the service will be a blessing to you. Well, all right. Good evening. Good to see you this evening. Let's stand together, if you would, with me, and we'll sing out together tonight. Let's just praise the Lord. Let's lift our voices together and praise the Lord, number 457 in your hymnal. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise. five it's just like his great love number 405 let's sing it out together this evening a friend have I called Jesus whose love is strong and true and never fails how air tis dry no matter what I do
so I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine. Aren't you thankful for His love? And uh, we should be able to talk about it forever and sing about it forever because of what He's done. Let's sing that last verse together. Oh, I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine, of all His care. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like His great love. Amen. You're singing great tonight. Good to see each one of you here. I'd like to cover something real quick just for our order tonight. Brother Dave, I know you're crunched on time as far as getting into the Pee Wee Patch Club. But we're going to pray for the service, the choir will sing, and then in that first song, we'll let them go down and just leave the other one out. Brother Dave will come and share testimony after that, uh, after the song the choir goes down. I want them to be able to see your slides and so forth. So, All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for a great day this morning. Thank you for the privilege to come back to church tonight. Thank you for our dear church family, Lord. What a great blessing it is to be able to meet together, to worship you, and sing these songs together. We thank you for your great love, Lord, how it has impacted us. I pray that you would allow us to see that love flow through us to impact many other people, not just here in Bartlett, but in Memphis and Lakeland and Arlington, all the surrounding areas and around the world. Help us, Father, I pray, to be a church yielded to you, so that would be the case. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. is going to sing tonight a song entitled Thou Art Worthy. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are created.
He is worthy. Let's stand together once more, if you would, with me. Number 389 in your hymnal, number 389. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, number 389. Let's sing it out together this evening. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Amen. Great singing. You can be seated. And uh, Brother Dave, if you want to come right on, we want to hear from you and hear about this trip to Thailand. I had the privilege, I think I mentioned this, I don't know if I shared it with you all or not, but I had the opportunity to give out a couple of tracts and invitations to church to two Buddhist monks, and they were from Thailand. And uh, so I was texted that to Dave and texted it to Jordan. Jordan was thrilled, man. He was so excited when he got that information. He said, I hope the Lord opens many more doors for you in that area. So come on, Brother Dave, and tell us about the trip. All right. Well, Pastor asked if I'd uh, give a quick report on the trip. So um, I asked Jackie for advice, so it won't be as quick. But um, the trip there really, really was blessed. It was a great uh, trip. Um, I don't know how many of you have Katrina on the Facebook, but they decided to take their, all their household stuff with us on the plane because it was cheaper than getting a container. So we ended up having a little over 40 bags um, or those uh, black and white containers from Lowe's uh, that went. So many, many thanks to Isaac and Pastor. Um, Isaac took us down there to the airport and Pastor came along along with uh, TL's very full covered trailer. Um, but everything got there. I, I really did not think all those bags would possibly make it. Um, but they did, uh, every, every single one of them. They didn't actually lose anything that, that we're aware of. Um, so, but also thank you to your, um, to 
to the church for your amazing support. Uh, while, they, while they were here, there's so many that I could thank, uh, but I would definitely risk leaving somebody out. So um, after a very long flight with uh, three kids who really, really did do very, very good, uh, Autumn very much enjoyed wandering around the plane um, with me in tow. Um, but we were really blessed when we first got there. I thought customs would be a nightmare bringing all that stuff into, uh, into um, through customs, especially with only Jordan and I really um, pushing them through. But uh, the, the people at the airport were great. They gave us these huge um, carts. And uh, they said, hey, what are you here for? And he said, I'm here to be a missionary. And they said, go ahead. And that was customs for us. And then as soon as we walked out, um, the church, uh, we were immediately greeted by this small crowd from the church with balloons and a, a big welcome to Thailand sign. And uh, it's amazing how you uh, feel instantly bonded with Christ uh, or within Christ with people that you've never met from halfway around the world. Um, it was really just a very, very sweet thing. So after loading the, a couple of the trucks and settling in the hotel, um, Jack and I spent the week um, watching the kids fighting jet lag and uh, exploring the beach and the surrounding areas. Uh, while the missionaries that are there, Mike and Panan uh, Lehman, who are absolutely just wonderful, rock-solid Christians, uh, helped Jordan and, and Katrina so much. Uh, within, that, within that first week, Jordan and Katrina had a house, um, they had a car, um, and were already moving in, you know, by, like I said, by the end of that first week. And they're in a really very nice but very simple small home uh, in a neighborhood where they're the only Americans. The rest are Thai. And... Um, um, the, the Thai people are just fascinated with those kids. Uh, I guess the blonde hair, blue eyes, um, especially with how big those blue eyes are. Um, but they all wanted to, to kind of meet. And um, their landlord is a, a Thai grandmother, a May, who is very, um, that, and, and that's their, she's very respected in that neighborhood. So we really feel like they are very, very safe. And, um, and, and a couple of them spoke English. So it seemed like doors are already opening up for us. And then at the very first service, that will always be a special memory. They, they called all of us up, including Jack and I, which, which we thought was very special. And uh, there's a lady that makes these beautiful roses. I think there's a picture in there. Um, she puts a flower on the top, but then all the roses underneath are made out of banana leaves. And uh, it's just, um, it really, really was very, very beautiful. And uh, they let us right away start jumping into the church. We got to, um, I won't really say door knocking, but we got to go hanging the, you're not allowed to go onto their properties. So you can go up to the gate and you can hang the stuff on the gate and you can try and talk to them. But if they don't invite you in, you absolutely cannot go in there. Um, and fighting off the dogs. There are a ton of stray dogs there. Um, they don't do anything with the dogs. So um, they just kind of lay in the street. They, they expect the cars to go around the dogs. It's really kind of fascinating. But um, we got to do that with them. And, you know, those people are so dedicated. They're out there in 85, 90 degree weather, um, walking down country roads. Um, so the first time Katrina and Autumn went with us after that, that was that. Um, but uh, the boys really kind of hung in there with us. And um, the English lessons, the children's church. And by the way, kids are kids around the world. We had so much fun with those Thai kids. Um, it was really, really great. And, but even with all that going on, Katrina and Jackie had the house set up within the second week. Um, so in Thailand uh, and what they'll be doing, uh, Thailand is a hard work um, at, with, with the church. Uh, Katrina and Jordan gave us a book about being missionary parents. And I'm sure the future elders um, understand. But the theme of that book is that it's hard. Uh, and it is. But, you know, the work there is even harder. And as you know, Jack and I lived overseas for 10 years, or you may know. Uh, so we've been in a lot of different countries. And Thailand really is everything it's cranked up to be. You know, it is a beautiful, beautiful place, uh, which has wonderful weather, if you like it hot. Um, and, and we were there in the cooler season. It was uh, in the 80s and 90s every day. Um, and, the, and the people there are just so very service oriented, right, um, and, and polite. And I can see why so many people like to vacation there. Um, but after you've been there a few weeks and the newness starts to wear off, um, you really start to see the deep need for Christ, um, especially in their eyes, uh, which to me was very similar to what I saw in Kosovo and Serbia right after the slaughter and the siege of Sarajevo. It was just an, an emptiness. Um, 
And, uh, you know, sometimes when we say they're lost and we need to pray for them, we, we just don't really think about it until you're there and you're seeing them. And, and those people that went to Honduras, um, you probably never thought of Honduras the same again uh, after you, you've really seen it. And, and it's the same thing. Mission trips are just so important. Um, for me, the massive work that he has for us, and that, of course it's Katrina and Jordan over there, but it's us praying for them and it's us sending them. Um, but it hit me uh, when Autumn got really fussy during one of the services. They don't have a nursery. Um, and she got loud and um, very much like her mom. She can get upset and loud. Um, so, you know, I took Autumn out of the service and we just went for a walk around the block. Um, but he really opened up my eyes and I started noticing the idols literally everywhere. Um, in their front yards, they have these, these little temples where they put stuff up. Um, and I'm really not sure if some of you guys are laughing at me or the pictures behind me, but, um, uh, you know, but they, they put these drinks and the food on the altars and it just stays there until it goes bad. And then men come and remove it. And it just seems, uh, it just, just the sheer number of them. They're lost. And it really burdened me for those people in the work. Um, and the, the sin just filled cities, right? So most of the people in the Navy, you know, when you think of Thailand, you either think of the beauty of the land or the deviancy and the alternate um, lifestyles. And I know we have a, a young crowd, so I'll just say alternate lifestyles. It just fills the bigger cities like Bangkok. It's, um, Satan has really twisted the Buddhist religion of peace. And, you know, it's really not just America anymore where acceptance and tolerance have just been twisted to cover sin. Um, and, and the language is extremely difficult. I brought back some tracks if anybody would like to see them that, that we, hand, we were handing out while we were over there. But the language is, is uh, what they call a tonal language. And, um, you know, for people like me that are tone deaf, which is why God gave me a hard of hearing wife for when I sing. But um, like the word cow is exactly the same as dog, except the tone is different. So it, so it, it really is, it's ma and ma. And you're like, mm, and I would not want to order food um, so, but the, the rules for the written language is even different. You know, Thai has 44 different constants and 32 vowels and markers. And then they have these things called tone markers. So they have a total of, um, 80 different, uh, letters in there. And, but when you write, you don't put spaces in between the word either. Um, and the vowels, they have these rules where the vowels are, can go on the left, the right, the top, or the bottom of the consonants. So... Um, and the reason I tell you that is because please pray for Jordan. He has one year to learn that language. And then he has to take a, a government language test that's both written and um, verbal. So um, in order to get his visa. So um, Isaac, do you have that, that video? Um, and just and when you watch his video, Jordan's preaching for the first time and, and Mike Panan is um, interpreting. So I just took a section where he tries to interpret what Jordan said that to us is very simple, but listen to how long it takes in time. There are wonderful truths in the Bible that we learn that Satan wants us to doubt. James, so, yeah, I hope you got that. But, um, and, and so, you know, pray for Jordan. He's, he's a preacher and he's a soul winner, and he can't do either one of those right now. And, um, you know, when you go through a long time and you haven't led anybody to the Lord, it's tough. Um, and, you know, he led somebody to the Lord right before he left. So, But um, the church there, it, it's very young. And the, the people there are just so genuine, and they have such a wonderful spirit. And, that, you know, they really are doing everything they can to, to reach the people around them. And they all get involved. It was, it was really, really very exciting. And they, they enjoyed the fellowship, and they had that kind of early church spark um, that, for me, was just, it was just so neat to see. And even though many of them are, are the only ones from their family that are saved, and they really do get ostracized from their families, um, and it's interesting how they can tolerate so many things other than Christ, you know. Um, but they still show up early and they stay late. It's like they're just hungry uh, to, to fellowship with the other believers. But I hope you saw all the smiles in those pictures. Uh, they're just a, a very, very happy people, and it's a, it's a lot of fun. And 
Um, you know, and while it is very hard to witness to the people, um, I do think that the kids there are going to be such a, a huge way to open doors as we had already started making friends at the, uh, the playground with the kids and the parents. And, and I guess, I don't, I'm not sure about it, I guess Thai, Thai women are just not really used to the men running around on the playground with the kids. Um, and I actually had to stop once because they were all, three or four of them just stood up at the edge of the playground and were looking at me. And so I was like, mm, and I didn't really know how to ask them if it was okay. But, um, but they, they, they were like, no, no, no. And I guess they were just fascinated. But yeah, I mean, it, the, those kids are so much fun. Um, but they were so fascinated by autumn that, you know, we would be pushing the stroller down the street because Katrina and Jordan would be gone, so we were walking every place, and people would just stop their mopeds and get off. And the first couple times, you know, I'm sure Josh understands this, you know, the hackles went up and I was looking for a bottle or a bar or something to protect the kids with, and, but they just wanted to take a picture with, with autumn. They just thought it was, she, she was fascinating because, you know, she'd just wave, you know, like the princess walking, going as they went by, and, um, but even the people at the, you know, the ladies at the um, hotel, and it just really, really opened up a lot of doors. So there's a lot of uh, great positive things in there. And uh, even while we were there, someone got saved at the English class that had been coming uh, for some time. At the end of every one of those English classes, um, they, they give the gospel out. And um, this lady uh, owns a, a restaurant, and she's in an alternate lifestyle. So pray for her. Her name is May um, and her growth. Uh, she's, got, she's got some challenges, and there's there's a, a lot of that in the, in the church where they really uh, just need to grow. But, um, and as many of you know, oh, Jack and I were really dreading leaving. I mean, dreading it before we even left here. <laughs> we were dreading leaving there. But, uh, you know, God in his goodness blessed us. Two days before we were supposed to leave, we went out and spent a day with this Thai couple, on and on and um, and uh, they took Jackie and I and the kids out to this, this big national park. Uh, and it was fascinating. Uh, well, because of time, we won't get into that. But, but they were just such genuine Christians. And they had such a genuine love for those kids that God just gave us such a peace the night before that um, I won't say we didn't cry, but it, it was a very, very, it was just a great peace that they're going to be okay. And thank God for technology. We get to talk to them every couple of days. So, um, you know, but it is a very hard mission field, and uh, the people of Thailand are just so incredibly confused. Um, you know, and, and God's will very, very often is hard, but it's always very good. And and uh, I don't know who sent it to me, but recently uh, somebody sent me something that said, "Hey, it's not about the magnitude of the task; it's about the master that gives it." So, if you would, um, please continue to pray that souls will be saved in Thailand. Um, pray for Jordan as he leads that family, um, and that he can learn the language, and that he can keep them safe. Pray for Katrina to give the kids stability and love um, through the stress of setting everything up and learning a different language, learning a different culture, and, and pray for the safety of the kids, but pray for that church to grow, and uh, pray that they'll find a, a language school that they can get into, and um, pray for those that my, like my that, that are saved that they'll be able to grow and uh, just separate from the lifestyle that they're in. It, it really is a great work. And again, thank you for supporting them so much. Hey, <laughs> Amen. All right, all you peewees can go with Captain Patch and Miss Jackie. Thank you, Brother Dave, for sharing that with us. Um, I want to encourage you. Uh, by the way, ushers, if you'll come, we're going to worship the Lord with our giving. Um, I want to encourage you while this is fresh on your mind to spend time praying for the Nichols every day this week, especially I know many of you will commit to pray for them every day from now on, but especially this week and really pray for Jordan about that language. Uh, that's definitely going to be challenged. There's no question about that. So, um, and pray for the hearts. Uh, I think we have another couple be going to see family in the near future. Pray for them as God uh, directs there. And let me just take the opportunity to encourage you. The next, and we're we've been talking about getting back to our missions trips. COVID kind of shut that down. Uh, but I want to encourage you if you've never been on one, a short-term trip. When we go again, if you're physically able, you ought to go. 
And uh, you say, well, I can't do much. If you can hand the gospel track out and smile, you can do something on the field. Amen. And you'll never regret it. It changes your life. And so, of course, we have plenty of mission work to do right here, too. So uh, anyway, well, let's pray. We'll pray for the nickels as we pray for our offering tonight. Our Father, we are blessed to uh, be able just to hear uh, about uh, the trip that Brother Hard has just come back from. We thank you for having a part in the Nichols being there, being able to support them and others that are on the field. Lord, I thank you for a church that does love missions, loves souls. It's very evident in the giving here at Eastside Baptist Church. Lord, I thank you for those that have invested many, many dollars over the years and this church has been able to invest uh, I guess in its time from the beginning millions of dollars perhaps in world missions and Lord we'll never regret that when we get to heaven I'm so thankful that we have a church that gives uh, to world missions and Lord we we pray for the offering tonight we ask that you would bless it uh, we pray that you would use it for your glory and continue to bless Eastside Baptist Church Lord help our light to shine strongly and brightly here and also around the world. People need Jesus everywhere we go. We'll keep that on our minds, Lord, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you so much. Appreciate the Nelson family and their sharing their gifts of music with us. I'm waiting on Brother Tim Nelson to share his gifts of singing with us. And uh, all right, some of y'all didn't laugh at that. Genesis chapter number eight. <clears throat> We're going to have one more look at Noah tonight, and then we'll be moving on past Noah. I'm not planning to go verse by verse in every section of uh, Genesis, but we are talking about foundations of our faith, and so we're going to take one more look at Noah, and he is a tremendous uh, example of faith and of righteousness. You heard me this morning say that Noah walked with God, and we read the passage from Hebrews 11, 7 about Noah as well, how he moved with fear, prepared the ark, and to the saving of his household. Now, uh, he moved with fear because God said judgment was coming. How often do we move with fear because judgment is coming? It is coming. I can remember sitting in a church pew before I knew I was born again and the preacher would preach. And I didn't go to church much, but man alive, I sat there scared to death. <laughs> and I got to say, it's a blessing to live without fear from that standpoint. We ought to fear God. We ought to respect Him. But I don't fear the rapture coming and me being left behind and things like that I used to. I don't fear what the flames of hell are going to be like because guess what? We're going to be in heaven. I was thinking about this. God's children are not treated fairly. Did you know that? We often are not treated fairly in the world. In fact, we're not even treated fairly by God. We're favored. Every one of us are spoiled. <laughs> we don't get what we deserve. We get what Christ deserves, and He purchased it on our behalf. Isn't that amazing? As I've been studying the, the book of Genesis here and, and reading about Noah, thinking about all those people that perished, uh, they got what they deserved. Noah did not. Although Noah was an upright and just man, God, he found favor in the eyes of God. Noah found grace because he believed God. That's faith. Let me just say a word about that. Faith moves you. Faith will cause you to act. If you ever wonder if someone has genuine faith or not, watch their life and see if it moves them, especially in a certain direction. Uh, there's a little church down the road here. I think it's that way. Yeah, they got, uh, what was it? The sign says, actions do not lie. Something like that. I don't know if that's exact quote or not, but I read it every time I go by there and I thought, boy, that's so true. Actions do not lie. So that's just a little extra. That's not the message tonight. Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged uh, the fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the hundred and fifty days the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat, and the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. We're not going to cover this in detail, but Noah and his family actually spent a year and one month on the ark before it was dry enough for them to get off the ark and start exploring where God had brought them. I've titled this section, Noah's Landing. Noah's Landing. You know, your life may get tossed to and fro, but if you believe God and you trust Him, you're going to have a smooth landing. Amen? And uh, we'll land safe on the other side one day, Lord willing. Now, I want you to see this very quickly. God remembered Noah. I love that statement. And it sounds kind of like if we said that, uh, you know, when you say, oh, pastor remembered so-and-so's name, first of all, you're shocked. And uh, secondly, though, it's different than when we talk about God. It says God remembered Noah. God had not forgotten Noah or misplaced him. The idea is that God was going to, first of all, there's an idea that God was protecting Noah. But secondly, that God would finish his plan with Noah. Turn your Bible to Revelation. I want to just kind of touch on that plan with uh, God's, uh, God's protection of Noah, Revelation chapter 7, and uh, let's see, let me look in my notes here. Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 1, you just read there or heard me read about the winds uh, blowing away the waters. Now here in Revelation chapter 7, during a time of great judgment and great tribulation, 
Uh, and by the way, can I say that God never changes throughout history and throughout the, the past and the future. We'll be gone when I'm, uh, what I'm reading about in Revelation 7 happens. But God still protects His own. He still takes care of them. Revelation chapter 7, now we hear about the angels holding the winds back. It says in Revelation 7, 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the, the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, listen, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, that's a different situation. The word is different, it's a, it, but it illustrates, I believe, what the Bible's talking about here when it says God remembered Noah. In fact, that word, that Hebrew word, literally means to mark or to bring to mind. So God, as I said, hadn't forgotten Noah. So we have an idea of protection in that statement. God remembered Noah. God's never going to forget you. But there's another thing. And by the way, you're already marked. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. If you are saved tonight, you are sealed by His presence and His power, and nothing can break that seal. You're on your way to heaven, and whatever happens in this world, they may, as the old song goes, uh, they may kill the body, but they cannot harm the soul. Amen? And so you're marked. God remembers you, and He will continue to remember you. But the other side of that is God completing the task. Philippians 1, 6, he's begun a good work in us. If we've accepted Christ, he's begun a good work in you and he will finish it. He's going to make us just like his son. So God remembered Noah. And I want you to notice, secondly, the ark rested. The ark, by the way, had no rudder, had no oars, no propulsion. You know, when, when Noah and his family got on that ark, they had to fully trust in God's power and uh, providence to move them where he wanted them to go. Now, I don't know how far they traveled. I suspect it wasn't very far, to be honest with you. I suspect that the waves tossed them, moved them around, but God brought them to Mount Ararat, which is a high point there in that region. And of course, the landscape has changed, I'm sure, since then. But there's where Noah landed. It was moved to the location that God wanted it to be. And Mount Ararat would be a symbol for the people of God to look to, to know of God's care. Even through the most dangerous storms of life, God's care and protection and provision, God remembers and He's going to land us safely. The ark rested. That is a wonderful truth. And boy, I think there's a whole sermon right in there. I'll let you develop that in your own mind. When you have God in your life, when you have Christ, you can rest in His care. Amen? And uh, you may face some storms, but He knows exactly what He's doing. Now I want to talk to you about that ark for just a couple of moments here. The ark, uh, as I said, had no rudder, but it was moved to a specific location there, Mount Ararat, and it came to a safe rest. You know, there are multiple claims of ark sightings. Uh, you can go on YouTube, you Google that, or YouTube it, whatever you do, you know. And uh, you can find video and pictures and things like that. And some of it looks kind of like some of the video we watched this morning, you know, very grainy and tough to see. Uh, but it was, it was the ark, according to some people. They, they're, first of all, is the Ararat anomaly. I just put a, several of these in my notes. A U.S. Air Force reconnaissance plane took black and white images of the northwest side of Mount Ararat in 1949, revealing a large object that resembles a portion of a ship. The images were made public in 1995 and sparked further interest. So they took the pictures in 1949, and uh, I guess maybe they were concerned about the rust to examine and so forth. But 1995, you can find those pictures. And it, it really looks like a mound, but it does look like a ship. It's got that shape. And then the Ahura Gorge, uh, one mile below the peak of Ararat, is Ahura Gorge. This site gained popularity when George uh, Hagapayan, an American, and I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but he's an American. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, fellas. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, he, <coughs> not an American, an Armenian, claimed his uncle took him on top of the ark as a young boy around 1908. Throughout his lifetime, he proclaimed that what he discovered as truth, but he was unable to pinpoint the exact location of his discovery. That was convenient. 
I bet he probably got to speak at a few events and maybe got some uh, pictures. But uh, and then the, there's another one. I could give you three or four more. But in 1948, there was the one that uh, heavy rain supposedly uh, uh, um, allowed an arc-shaped formation to be revealed 15 miles from the summit of Mount Ararat. And a 1960 expedition found only dirt and rocks. But explorer Ron Wyatt, now if you've done any research on this, you might have heard of his name. But Ron Wyatt went back in the 70s and 80s claiming he found an outline of metal fittings using a frequency generator. Uh, and then this one, I want to tell you this because I want to say these words, Mount Cootie Judy. <laughs> that just sounds fun, doesn't it? Mount Cootie Judy. And it uh, sounds like something you would say about some kid in grammar school. Judy's got cooties. But anyway, Mount Cootie Judy. Some ancient writers said people could still see the ark in the New Testament times at Mount Cootie. An expedition found wood in 1953 encouraging further expeditions. And on and on they go. Now, here's my question. Do we need to find the ark? Absolutely not. You know why this right here is of more value than any eyewitness testimony, any experience, any picture they can bring to us. We don't need that art. We know that God did what he claimed to do. And besides, you know, I happen to think that it's very likely, and maybe they found stuff. If they found it, I wouldn't be like, oh my goodness, can't believe it, you know. I'd be like, wow, that's pretty interesting. And I'd want to see it. The reason God does not allow us to have things like that is people would put up shrines somewhere. They'd have a piece of it. They'd worship it. They'd make it a God and all those kind of things, and nonsense, but we don't need it. We believe God. We believe His Word, and not, Noah likely would have repurposed that wood. I mean, if everything's wiped out, and you had a giant wooden boat, and you needed a house, what would you do? I'd build me a house out of the wood off of that ark, you know, or at least live in it, and they did live in it for several months. Now, I want you to move on to chapter, uh, uh, to verses 6 through 12. I want to talk about this olive branch. Uh, here in Genesis chapter 8, let, let's write, read on down or just slide on down to verse number 11. You know the story pretty well. Noah sent out the, the dove. Uh, first he sent out the raven. The ravens aren't as friendly as doves. And uh, he had a hard time getting the raven to come back. But the, the dove went out and then came back. And you know the story, verse 11, the dove came into him in the evening and lo in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth, and he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. Now, if you do some reading about the olive branch, uh, what secular history is going to say is that in 5 BC, the Greeks came up with the olive branch as the uh, symbol of peace. But this is where the symbol of peace from the olive branch comes from. It comes from the Word of God. You say, Pastor, why is that important? Because it's picturing that judgment has passed and peace has been made available by God. In fact, think about the extreme measures that God has gone to to make peace with mankind. God's not the one that rebelled. Man is. God put man in a garden with, with everything he could ever dream of needing. Nothing, I mean, everything was perfect in that place. It was very good, God said. And then man chose to rebel against the commandment of God. And that's what's happened down through history over and over and over. And you know what? God didn't say, I wash my hands of them. I'm just going to get rid of all of them, never do it again. When he did destroy the world, it had reached a certain peak of wickedness. And I think we're approaching that peak of wickedness again. And uh, as it was, in the days of Noah, I mentioned that last week, it is today, and so you think about that, but God has taken extreme measures to offer peace to mankind. God extends the olive branch through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when you see a tree in the Bible, you think about the word, the tree there, Jesus hung on that tree, that cut down tree on our behalf. He died for our sins so that we could have peace with God. Romans 5, 1 and 2, therefore being justified by faith, and that's exactly what worked in Noah's favor his faith in God made him favored by God he we are justified by faith we have what peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ now think about that I'll tell you what it's a blessing to have that peace it is the only way to have peace, and it is offered by God. God extends the olive branch to mankind through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'll give you a couple of verses. You can jot these down. I know you probably know them. Not only do we have the peace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ or peace with God, we can have the peace of God because of Christ. 
Remember the ark rested. That's a picture of peace. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Colossians 3, 15, and 16. And you can look those up, and it talks about having peace with God. Colossians uh, admonishes us to let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let me read this. This is how I believe one of the ways you make that happen. Colossians 3, 16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. How do I have peace? peace, the peace of God, after I have peace with God, I let His Word be the guide to my life. That's exactly how. I can't say enough about it. In fact, that's why I didn't want to, I thought about just skipping on past this part of the story of Noah and being, moving on to the next big event in the Old Testament, but the reality is we need every bit of the Word of God. Amen. And so I hope you're reading your Bible every day. I hope you're meditating on it. I hope you're allowing the Bible to shape your life. We have the peace with God through Christ. We have peace, the peace of God through obedience to His Word and the application of His Word to our lives, not to mention the promises that He gives us. I want you to notice very quickly Noah's commission, verses 15 through 19. The Bible says here, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee, Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both the fowl and cattle and of every creeping thing. Skip on down to verse 18. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife uh, and his son's wives with him. Uh, verse 19. Every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. There's a couple things I probably would have left off, you know. I'd have let them drown, you know. A few, few little creepy crawlies that I can think of. But what was Noah's commission? His commission was to go forth, to leave the ark. Could you imagine the kind of intense emotion? Now, you've got to think about what has happened. The entire world has been annihilated. There are no other living people or creatures other than what's on the ark. The wrath of God has been poured out, I mean, in a way that changed the entire world. And then God says, Noah... Time to get off the ark. In fact, the reality is God must have opened the door because God's the one that shut them in. And so you have this uh, time for Noah to, listen, think about this, to go out. Sometimes it's hard for us to go out. Sometimes we have some fears, but I'll tell you what, I think Noah had to exercise faith to walk out the door of that ark and step on that ground again. This was an act of faith. Go forth, God says. And I want to tell you, I think we are supposed to be going forth today as well. And then God says to Noah to bring forth. Noah was to lead. He was to lead his family and the animals off of the ark. He was to bring them out. And from the family of Noah, all the earth, all the peoples of the earth began to come from those three fellows. Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Now, I don't have time to dig into all of that, and you could probably do a little research on it if you would like to, but they overspread the earth. Everyone living today can trace their family DNA to one of those three men. So why do I need some Chinese-based company to tell me who I'm related to? <laughs> Better be careful about all that. I don't want somebody having my DNA. My kids have my DNA. That's enough for me. Amen. And so you think about all those things. But Noah went forth and he was to bring forth and he was to tell others what God had done. And Noah began to do that. Later men began to call upon the Lord again. And, and through the family of Shem we see God doing some great things. And so the fourth thing I want you to see is God's covenant with Noah. And I, I think we'll have to stop with this. Uh, we'll see how fast we get through this part. Look at verse 20 of Genesis chapter 8, and it goes down uh, through chapter 9. I may not read all of chapter 9, but I want you to see this in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast. Now notice, by the way, what Noah did first when he got off that ark. He worshiped God. That sets a great precedent. Man was put on earth to worship God. Not to live any old way we please. We're here to honor God. And Noah set a precedent that day. One of the things he did first right off the bat was he built an altar to worship God with. Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, 
I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I give uh, again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Now listen, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. God didn't say it used to be before the flood. He said it is. We're still born with a sin nature. We look at those little babies when they're born and we say, oh, they're so sweet. Look at that little angel. No, that's not a little angel. That's a little sinner. <laughs> and they need Jesus. He says we're, they're evil from their youth. That explains a lot about what's going on today. Man, When man ignores God, they go deeper into the darkness and the abyss of iniquity. And that's what we're seeing in the world in which we live. He says, verse 22, while the earth remaineth. Listen, I love this verse. You young people, I want you to listen to this. You're growing up being inundated with a lie about global warming and the ozone layer being gone. When I was a kid, they told me that all the hairspray I was using, the, the ozone layer would be gone by the time I'm this age. And we'd be burning up off of the face of the earth. Guess what? It was another lie. And so he says here, while the earth remaineth, and I'm going to take God's word for it, amen, I encourage you to do the same. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, listen, shall not cease. Can I tell you, there is a day when global warming is going to be a reality. It's coming during the tribulation period, and boy, I tell you what, I hope nobody I know is here during that time. But this world is reserved. It's reserved by the promise and power of a providential God, a holy God that's never broken his word one time. He's not going to break it this time. You know what? Don't worry about what Greta says. Worry about what God says. Amen. And uh, I don't care how many letters they got after their name. They cannot overrule the word of God. Amen. Amen. I believe this book, and I want to encourage you to believe it too. And so, young people, listen, you children, do not have to fear the world being burned up and gone before you grow into adulthood. God has promised to keep it. And listen to it again. It says here, while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and cold and heat, I love it, in summer and winter and day and night, shall not cease. Get into chapter 9 here, and God gives Noah the symbol of that covenant, which is the rainbow. That symbol belongs to God's people. Amen. And these perverts that have taken it away are anti-God. They hate God and they hate you and I for believing this book. But it's ours. It doesn't belong to them. Amen. It is a symbol of peace. It is a symbol of hope. But it is not a symbol of perversion. It belongs to the people of God. Sorry. I get a little angry when I see people steal from God and ignore God at the same time. It's awful to think about. Well, anyways, God blessed Noah, verse 1 of chapter 9, uh, and his sons, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. And uh, <clears throat> skip on down to verse 5. I want you to see this. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by, man's, uh, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God... Made he man. That is the primary reason that capital punishment should be in effect. In the image of God made he man. And you be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And he gives later this covenant sign. Verse 12. And God said this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you. And every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And you know it's wonderful to listen to some scientists explain a rainbow. Well you got the light. And it reflects, uh, refracts off of the, the water vapor in the cloud. And it does this. And then it breaks it down. And you see the prism of colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And it's all so wonderful. And isn't it amazing how all this evolved? God did that. And every time you see a rainbow, I want you to tell yourself, God loves mankind. God loves me. Think about that. What a wonderful truth it is. And it is, it is the height of wickedness to make that a symbol of perversion. It is so sad. It just tells you where we are in society today. 
And so God says here, that token of that covenant will be between me and the earth, verse 13, and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember, there's that word remember again, my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant. Notice there it's an everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. We don't have time to talk about it. There are eight covenants in the Bible. And I may mention those, Lord willing, we come back to this next Sunday night. Uh, but I want you to think about these things. And, and remember, God's promise here applies to all. It is unconditional. And it is a promise that dismisses the fallacy of global warming. It is a promise that tells us God loves man. God loves you. And so it's a wonderful truth here to think about the bow that God put in the sky. God's covenant with Noah. And... Um, I think that it is important to recognize the fact that there are covenants in the Bible, but, uh, and those covenants, some are conditional, some are unconditional. This one is unconditional. And there's an unconditional covenant for you if you've trusted Christ as your Savior. And that is, you are going to heaven no matter what. That covenant, Jesus Christ keeps your part of the covenant for you. And uh, it's a wonderful truth. Well, we don't have time to get into it, but in Genesis chapter 9, we're going to have to come back and look at this. Noah becomes a, a farmer, plants a vineyard, and he harvests the grapes, and, and then there are some problems that come as a result of that. So we'll have one more lesson on Noah. Uh, but I want to just say another word about that rainbow. Could you imagine Noah and his family every time it began to rain? Every time the thunder kind of hit, lightning strike. The clouds up in the sky, all of a sudden, you know, I can imagine, especially when the kids started having small children, and they heard the stories, you know. And so God said, I'm going to do something. Think about how much God loves us. God said, I'm going to do something so that when that thunderstorm comes, when there's fear in the heart of a child or in Noah or his family, I want them to look up and recognize the fact that I will never destroy the earth by a flood again. I'll tell you what, that's a loving God. Amen? God loves you. God loves me. And guess what? He loves the Thai people. He loves our neighbors. He loves the most hateful people in the world. You know, he loves that crowd that's robbed us of the rainbow. He loves them. Jesus died for them. Can I tell you, when you leave here tonight, I want to encourage you to share the gospel with every person you see. Uh, and who's your one? Go after somebody. Bring them to the cross. Amen? Who's your one? Let's make a difference in somebody's life. Let's help. Let's take the olive branch of Jesus Christ to someone this week. Let's stand for prayer. Thank you all for listening so well tonight. I sure appreciate our church family. I love to study the Bible. I love to share its truth. And uh, I hope God blesses your heart as we study through uh, these different chapters of Genesis. Father, we thank you today for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for the, the love that we see in the Word of God. And yes, judgment does come. But Lord, we see even in the case of the flood, you prolonged that judgment for a long time. You gave warning 120 years before you allowed that judgment to fall. And I believe Noah, as the Bible says, a preacher of righteousness declared that truth until the day that you shut him in on the ark. Help us to be like that. Lord, I pray tonight, once again, that you would lay some soul upon our hearts and love that soul through us. I pray this in Jesus' name. And Lord, if there's someone here tonight that needs to accept that olive branch of peace through Jesus, I pray that tonight they'd get that settled. Thank you for the testimony we heard today of the mayor. He came back on a Sunday night and got born again. We pray for that tonight. If there is someone here that needs to make that decision. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we sing tonight, Brother Isaac's going to lead us. God spoke in your heart. You come tonight. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, 
What a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Look this way if you would real quick. I want to give a couple of announcements as we get ready to be dismissed. Don't forget we do have the revival cards uh, for our upcoming revival. And we did order some Easter cards, I think. Brother Isaac, are those on the way, the Easter cards? Yes, that's what we ordered this week. Good. And we have also, there's some tracks out there that really emphasize Easter. Pick those up and take them with you. Please, please take a card and pray for people that are lost in other countries that need a missionary to come to them. Would you take one of those cards and be an intercessor prayer warrior? Now, our senior saints, don't forget uh, this week, uh, is it this, this coming Tuesday or next Tuesday? It's the following Tuesday. Thank you all. Uh, and so, senior saints, if you would sign up for that, we'll have a great time. And don't forget, next Sunday, we'll have an early service, 5 p.m. service and then 6 p.m. outreach. And so uh, I, I want to encourage you to come. It'd be great to have you help us with that outreach. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. I'll just go ahead and pray, and we can be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much again for your love and mercy. Thank you for our people. And, Lord, I do pray that you'd help us to uh, be faithful witnesses for you. Thank you for these many promises that we see and many uh, wonderful truths in the story of uh, Noah. And, God, I pray that we would learn and grow as a result of it. Uh, Lord, help us to be reminded when we see that rainbow, it's because of your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed.